Hello everyone. As part of our Saving Lives webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, CPR Report Cards, What's Your Grade? And now I'd like to introduce you to Kimberly Kelly, who is our moderator today. Kimberly is a staff nurse and lead responder at Legacy Emanuel Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. She has been a very active member of the Association of Critical Care Nurses and is currently a regional board member. In 2015, Kimberly wrote a widely used self-learning module for use in her facility on Code Blue. Kimberly, welcome, and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special occasion today, and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? I am ready. Good morning or good afternoon to some of you. Thank you, Emily, for that very kind introduction. The title of today's webinar is CPR Report Card. What is your grade? Speaking today on this very timely topic is a colleague and friend of mine, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole has practiced as a critical care nurse for over 20 years. About 15 years ago, she began working at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, Washington, and this change spurred an interest in resuscitation. Shortly thereafter, Nicole was part of a multidisciplinary team that was one of the first in the United States to implement therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. As part of this effort, Nicole was responsible for protocol development and has published numerous papers on this topic. In 2013, Nicole founded Nicole Kupchik Consulting and Education. She has a few disclosures to announce. She is on the Speakers Bureau for Physio Control, now part of Stryker, La Jolla Pharmaceuticals, and Cheetah Medical, as well as being a consultant for Physio Control, now part of Stryker, and Baxter Healthcare. Continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. A link to obtain your CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. The accreditation statements are as below, and support for this educational activity is provided by PhysioControl, now part of Stryker. Nicole, are you ready to get started? I am ready. Good morning, everyone. So I'm really excited. There's um sounds like there's been a lot of people who've been able to tune in to the last few webinars. This is actually the fifth webinar that we've done um, since last year. So this is just basically a continuation of the previous webinars, and I'm doing a little bit of a deeper dive on basically on giving feedback to your teams on CPR quality. So what we're going to do this morning or afternoon for some of you is we're going to discuss the importance of high quality CPR uh, during cardiac arrest. I'm not going to go over the specifics of exactly what high quality or high performance CPR looks like, but I'm going to focus more on the feedback and um, data and feedback that you can um, give to your teams. Um, we're going to talk about post-event feedback um, using CPR report cards. So this is kind of an, it's actually a pretty, it's a newer innovative thing that you can do um, with your defibrillator. So I'll kind of go through that. And then we're going to talk about common issues that are very correctable. And then what I'm going to do throughout the presentation is I'm going to give you a series of, of CPR report cards and then I'm going to let you assign them a grade and just let me know what you think, you know, how the improvement went. So, all right, so with this, we are going to launch a poll. Okay, so here's the question. Is your hospital measuring CPR quality and giving feedback to teams? And that could come in a number of different ways. So just yes or no, or maybe sometimes, are you actually measuring your CPR quality and giving feedback to teams? So what do you guys think out there? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. This is actually more than I thought we'd have. So 47% of you are saying yes, 31% no, and then 23% sometimes. Because I will tell you, it's it's not a usual thing uh, to be giving CPR feedback to your team. So, um, so I, I'm just this is really exciting to see progress actually over the last few years. Okay, so let's just dive in here a little bit. And um, in chat, so there's lots of different ways you can optimize CPR performance. So we've already in the past webinars we've talked about metronomes um, and just kind of having a, an auditory cue up to kind of get you on cue with your CPR. Um, there's real-time feedback devices. This is a picture of one of many different types you could use where you get kind of an auditory and visual cue on your CPR. We can use capnography. I did a whole session on capnography. Um, like 
some hospitals are actually assigning a CPR coach, so somebody who their only role in the code is to monitor CPR quality. Um, but bottom line is, is the ideal situation is to fix issues as they happen. So if you've got somebody who's compressing way too fast, slow them down, fix it right away as it's happening. That would be the ideal situation. However, we're finding that there is some major benefit to post-event review. So let's say you have a code, and then maybe like a week or two weeks later getting your team together it may not be the exact team that you know responded to a code because we all know in hospitals it's almost impossible to recreate that exact team because of staffing um, patterns and things like that but we do know that there is a lot of benefit to post-event review so what does the American Heart Association say well what they recommend is that you should be using any data that you're collecting from your defibrillator or device that's used in your resuscitations that's collecting data uh, to give feedback to your teams and you may not know this but every defibrillator has the ability to collect data during your resuscitations now the one thing is you would need software to download that data but the software I mean relatively speaking is pretty inexpensive um, so a couple things so I just want to explain how this works um, so let's say you use this defibrillator in your code um, what, and I'll show you how the uh, data are derived, but data automatically downloads from the defibrillator and it can give you um, CPR quality. You can look at rate, you can look at depth, assess chest compression fraction. Um, you can kind of see how long did it take us to defibrillate a patient when they were in a shock oral rhythm. The other thing you can assess are um, shocks, or I'm sorry, uh, pauses around uh, defibrillation events. And then if you're using capnography, you can see how fast uh, the patient is getting ventilated or how fast they're receiving assisted ventilations and and you all know if you've tuned into the other webinars we over ventilate like crazy and I'll show you a couple cases today so so how exactly does this work well what happens is um, newer generation defibrillators so they collect data um, and impedance data is um, derived from your defibrillation patches so you know the patches you put on to defibrillate so that data is collected into the defibrillator itself then what happens is in most new generation defibrillators there's a wireless transmission to a cloud or some sort of a um, some sort of a cloud or, or a place where the data can um, uh, transmit and then what happens is it downloads into your software program now um, some older generation defibrillators uh, there's a the way you would get the data is go directly to that defibrillator and download it directly from the de defibrillator it, that's a little bit onerous it's kind of a hunt and find of you know find the exact defibrillator that was used during the cardiac arrest so the newer generation we're doing wireless transmission into the software and data database and then what happens is usually you go in and you'll look at the case review the case some um, kind of clean it up and then you can um, get it to the end users in a number of ways you can change the report card into a PDF and email it you can have meetings and um, you know maybe bring your a laptop and show them the data um, you can print the data there's there's lots of different ways you can get feedback to your teams but the bottom line is you're never going to improve what you're not measuring and so this is the advantage of using a software program like this now because and it's just because of the limitations of basically PowerPoint um, what I've had to do is take some of these report cards and break them up into different pieces so so what I want to do is just show you so this is a typical CPR report card a couple things you might notice um, and I'm gonna blow this up in a, um, a couple in um, the next couple slides here in a minute but I've got my mouse I'm kind of circling this first uh, area that it, this dial it says compression ratio so that's the percentage of time you're on the chest giving compressions and you can see in this resuscitation 89 percent of the time they're on the chest um, they were compressing an average of 128 a minute so that's a bit fast and that's something you definitely would want to slow down um, in this uh, resuscitation they didn't hook up capnography so we don't have any information on ventilation rates so I would definitely give feedback to the team and say you know um, was there a or just ask you know was there a barrier to using capnography and then you can see in this uh, report they were compressing on average an inch and a half which is 
it's too shallow, so you've got to press deeper. And then um, compressions that hit the target depth, only one single compression hit the target depth. And actually, this is a very common problem we're seeing in resuscitations, especially in hospitals, because, again, we're compressing patients on a bed that's elevated, on a mattress that's bouncing up and down. And so you can see here, we also got the initial rhythm, so you all know that's ventricular fibrillation. Um, you can't see this as well, but it'll tell you um, how many compressions um, the patient received, uh, how many pauses were over 10 seconds, and then the length of the longest compression pause. So here, in this resuscitation, the longest pause was 21 seconds. Now, if we go over to the right, this is just giving you kind of a bird's eye view. This was about a 15-minute code, so you can see I started it on this page and then continued it over here, but it was about a 15-minute code. and. Um, the little red dashes indicate chest compressions. So where you don't see red dashes, those were pauses that were taken for either a rhythm assessment, a pulse check, or, or whatever it is. Um, and then if you kind of look over to the right, you can see the compression rates. So you can see here 125, 130, 120. And so for the most part, they were compressing too fast. And then the very last three minutes, they used a depth meter, and you can see had a really hard time hitting depth. So why do you think they'd have such a hard time hitting depth? Well, look at their rate. They're compressing way too fast. And when you compress too fast, you're not going to hit depth. And then finally, down here on the bottom, you can see these are all the defibrillation events. And so you can see shock 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And you can tell exactly what time the shocks were administered, how much energy was used. So they escalated the energy. So that would be some really good feedback. They got up to 360 joules pretty quickly. And then the, this is the part I love, is it will calculate the t amount of time off the chest from giving compressions before the shock and then after the shock. So for example, the first shock, they were pretty much on the, um, the chest the entire time. Um, the second shock, there was about a 14 second pause total. That's a little longer than we like. The third one was about 10 seconds and so on. And so you can really get an idea if you've got issues in your facility with um, pauses around defibrillation. So, okay. All right. So how does the defibrillator get information? Well, when you place your defibrillator patches, so when you place the patches on your patient's chest, there's an impedance signal and information that comes from those patches. And the defibrillator can interpret that impedance change. And so, for example, you can see here, we've got th this green wave is the impedance signal that's coming from those patches. And you can see a big change in that wave. And that's what chest compressions look like. So you can see it'll calculate how fast you're giving compressions. And if I didn't have a big wave, um, it would just look like a flat line. Now, this is what it looks like when compressions aren't being given. So this is actually a real case where the patient clearly was in ventricular fibrillation. But do you see how this wide waveform looks a lot different than the skinny waveform? And this is basically, this is the assisted ventilation and um, movement in the chest that's being picked up by those patches and interpreted as, as an impedance signal. So the, during this time, we should have seen either a shock or these big CPR waves, but they weren't providing chest compressions during this time. And so we're going to look at some of those cases and how you know you could give feedback to your teams um, on their CPR quality. Okay, so this is another case. Um, where um, what I'm going to do is uh, you can kind of take a glance at the CPR report cards. I was able to fit the whole report card on this uh, this slide, but you can see their chest compression fraction was 92%. They were compressing 101 a minute, um, giving assisted ventilations at about uh, looks like four a minute. So that was kind of interesting. But um, but you can also get a trend in the capnography. So they hooked up capnography about four minutes into the case. You can see down here at the four minute um, uh, mark that they've hooked up capnography. And it looks like it picked up four, the four ventilations at the end of that minute. But then the next cycle, they're ventilating about 18 um, a minute, which is really, that's too fast. And so you can kind of see this is the breakdown. So again, these are your kind of quality dials. Really easy for staff to read. So you can see 92% of the time they were on the chest, which is a really good goal. We usually set our goal for 90 to 100. Some facilities set their goal for 80 to 100 to be on the chest. But in general, this looks really good. Um, the other thing is that they were compressing on average 101 a minute, which is right where we want it. And then I'm not sure about, because capnography was only put on for the last minute and maybe like 20 seconds, um, I actually would prefer to go look at the minute by minute breakdown versus the style. Then you can see here the initial rhythm was a wide complex uh, 
pulseless electrical activity. So there was electrical activity, but um, there was no perfusion uh, generated from that activity. And that's very common. Actually, in hospitals, uh, the most common type of cardiac arrest is a PEA, just like you see here, um, which is unfortunate because our survival is very low because of that. Um, so again, initial rhythm is PEA. And then in this slide, what you're able to see are the capnography trends. And so you can kind of see here it's on a scale of 0 to 20. So during this code, for the most part, the uh, capnography was less than 20. And during arrest, I, I, that's kind of what I expect. A lot of times when you get return of spontaneous circulation, you'll see a big jump in those capnography trends. And then you can tell here five, a total of 580 compressions were administered. They had one pause over 10 seconds. And the longest this pause was 31 seconds, and that's a really long time for a pause. In one of the previous webinars, I gave some information about the detriment of pauses, and basically, uh, survival goes down precipitously when you have one single pause over 20 seconds. So, so that's something I would definitely want to clean up and give some feedback to the team about those pauses and just making sure that we've got someone staying on the chest for uh, the um, while well, the patient's pulseless. So this is the bottom portion of the report card, and you can see here, um, uh, basically the resuscitation started at minute zero, and there was about a 31 or 32 second delay in getting compression started, and I will tell you that's a very common finding. Um, and then you can see the red dashes, those are the chest compressions. So during this code, they were pretty right on with the, um, the chest compression rate, so that is some positive feedback I would give to the team. Um, the, Maybe uh, like things that we could improve is, um, you know, we've got this big 30 some second delay, so just getting on the chest quicker, but also they're overventilating. So you can see um, at minute five, these blue upside down, um, or these little blue triangles are assisted ventilations. So this patient got 18 assisted ventilations when really your goal should be 10. And the problem with overventilating is that you increase your intrathoracic chest pressure, which decreases venous return, which has a direct impact on CPR quality. So those are some things that, you know, uh, we there's good information here in that we've got our perfectly under control. The thing that we need to really improve is the assisted ventilation. Okay, so we're going to keep going with this. So here's another poll. So what I want to know from you is what do you think your biggest challenge is in codes? So what do you guys think? Is it chest compression rates that are too fast or depth that's too shallow? Is it pauses around, you know, in compressions around defibrillation events? Um, are you ventilating too fast? Are you forgetting to connect capnography? Or are you guys golden? Do you not have any issues? Because that may be the case for some of you. So, all right, so what do you guys think? What do, what are your, what do you think your biggest issues are? And maybe you've measured your, your uh, CPR quality. Yeah, not surprised by this. So a lot of you are, are saying your chest compression rates are too fast or depth is too shallow. That is a common issue in hospitals. Um, the second most were um, pauses and, again, common issues in hospitals and then overventilation. So, yeah, this is, I'm not surprised by these results. Okay. Um, so, and I think, you know, that just knowing what your issues are, you can work on really improving, um, you know, a lot of your problem areas because this is very doable. This is definitely something that can um, be worked on and improved. All right, so the, now here's a question. Does debriefing post-event improve outcomes? So getting these CPR report cards. So this was a hospital. It was um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and Heather Wolf is a PI, and Heather Wolf is amazing, absolutely amazing physician. And um, anyway, what they did was um, in pediatric patients who are eight years or older, they used these CPR report cards and um, to give feedback to their team. So what they did was about once every couple weeks, they bring a group of people together that were on the Code Blue team uh, who would actually respond to code. So nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, they'd bring a whole group of people together and they would review their codes that had happened since their last meeting. They would give the patient's history, um, any uh, pre-arrest studies, so any CT scans, x-rays, labs, and then they would look at their quantitative resuscitation data. So CPR rates, CPR depths, etc. And then they would give the patient outcome and summary. So does doing something like this way after the fact make a difference? And what they found was really surprising. They found absolutely it made a difference. So you can see here, their discharge rates went up. So, so that's survival, went up. Now, the thing is, that it wasn't quite statistically significant, but here's what reached statistical significance, is they actually had better neurologic outcomes once they started doing this. And they, I think they had done this for a couple of years, and they continue to do this um, today. 
And um, so patients had better neurologic outcomes. So why might that be? Well, check this out. So look at the graph on the right side. And what they found was that every CPR quality metric improved once staff started getting feedback and once staff started paying attention. And this does make a difference. So even after the fact, we know it makes a difference. Now, it's not going to make a difference for that patient there and then if you were compressing too fast or too shallow, but in future arrest, it definitely has an impact on performance. So now, let's kind of dig deep and um, let's look at some of these cases. So the first case I'm going to show you is um, rapid chest compression rates. And so you can see here, um, if I, you kind of look at this bar, we've got a 142, a 138, a 134, then um, a 105. So the compression rate ended up being 105. Um, looks like they slowed it down, but the unfortunate thing was they had kind of a big pause here at minute three. Um, you can see a 121, a 136, so way too fast. And you know, the easiest thing to fix this is a metronome. You can see down here, 166, and you can see how close these little red bars are together. So someone was basically like jackhammering on someone's chest. This is way too fast because at 166 you're not going to hit depth okay you're just you're not going to and a metronome will fix this immediately um, and then uh, surprisingly though the patient got raw even with those big fast compression rates but anyway we won't judge all right so and then what happened was is that same patient ended up rearresting so they got the patient back and then they rearrested and went to a wide complex tachycardia the patient was pulseless with this and what you can see here from this waveform um, it doesn't look look like a CPR impedance waveform, does it? No, what happened was there was a big delay in getting chest compressions restarted. So there was um, almost a minute delay in getting chest compressions restarted. So this is data, again, you know, you could just give your teams to say, you had this patient who arrested, we need to slow down these chest compression rates, use your metronomes, um, but also there was a delay in, in identifying that the patient re-arrested. So, um, so anyway, so good feedback that you can give to the team. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a progression case and then at the end of these two cases I'm going to have you give a grade so you're actually going to score this report card so this was um a case where uh, you can see uh, basically we had a PEA STEMI arrest, so you can see the ST elevations uh, here on this initial rhythm, so I'm using my, my cursor to identify this. And then um, you can see their ch chest compression ratio is 81%, so you know, like that's, it's a four minute code, so if you look, kind of look down here, it's a four minute code, um, so they had a big gigantic pause at minute two. Um, their rates, you can see 137, 129, 128, 142, so the rates were really fast. Okay, so then what this team started doing was giving these CPR report cards to physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists who were on the team. So not even two months later, here is their next report card. So, so you can see here, you know, again, big pause at minute two and then uh, compression rates that were too fast. So not even two months later, here's their next report card. So similar case, it was a PEA arrest, so let me just kind of take you back. So it was a PEA arrest uh, with ST elevation, so it was a six minute code. And we see this, we see STEMIs come in and have these little short bursts of PEAs, but um, PEA arrest. But you can see the chest compression fraction is 97%. They're compressing 114 a minute, um, averaging about 109. And you can see there are minimal pauses. So with that, so this was the progression in two months. We had 81% to 97. Uh, we were jackhammering in the 130s. Now we're at 114 using a metronome. So what I want you guys to do is we're going to launch a poll here is I want you to give this a grade. So here's our poll. What grade would you give this? Would you give it an A plus in that two minute change? So you're grading the improvement. Would you give it an A plus, a B plus, a C plus, or are they going to detention? What are we doing here? So how would you grade this improvement? Oh, okay, all right, so you guys give it a B plus. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, yeah, I, 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 I would agree, I think it's a definite huge improvement. This was good, I mean, they really, they had a huge improvement. So, yeah, I agree, I would give this either an A or B plus. This was really a nice improvement um, in this, uh, the CPR quality, and that's going to have an impact on patient outcomes. All right, let's look at depth. 
All right, so here is a case um, where basically uh, they're, they're jackhammering at 141 a minute, so going really fast on compressions. And you can see these little blue dots indicate the depth. And I actually showed this in one of the webinars last year, but at 141 a minute, they were only hitting a half inch depth. So these purple lines are where the depth should be. So that's where you know, like if, if we were actually hitting depth, the line would be way down here. So again, when you're compressing too fast, you're not going to hit depth. And this would be really good feedback to give your teams on their CPR quality. All right, so then we'll do a minute by minute breakdown. So what this, so this is a few months later. So a few months later, uh, we have this team that started uh, using their metronomes. And you can see the CPR rates got completely under control. 104, 105, 104, 107. So really did a nice job. And then, but here's the problem, is they're ha still having issues hitting depth. And we think a lot of the issues with hitting depth have to do with the mattress swing. So this is an in-hospital rest, and we think that mattress bouncing up and down is really preventing us from hitting depth. There is a lot of force that has to come uh, to overcome that swing in the mattress. And so I, these have been fascinating data to really learn about, um, you know, by doing these CPR report cards. Okay, let's look at issues with pauses. So pauses are a lot of you identified would be something that you know an issue that you've got at your hospital. Okay, so now I'm just going to warn you. I'm going. I'm going to have you grade this. So you're going to grade this. So I want you to look at the progression. All right, we've got a patient who's in V-fib, so they're in ventricular fibrillation. So they're doing CPR. You can see this is the impedance signal up here at the top. They're doing CPR, uh, doing CPR, and then what happens here? They stop. What happens in the next row? They stop. The next row, no CPR. The next row, no CPR, and then they shock. Okay, so that was the first case, a 38-second pause before their shock. Is that our goal? And the answer is absolutely not. So what this facility did was they started giving feedback to their teams on their CPR quality. And I want you to see the progression. So then two months later, you could see, again, similar case, VFib. They're doing chest compressions. They do a rhythm check for eight seconds, get right back on the chest, and their pause around their shock was about four seconds. There's a blanking period here that happens with the defibrillation, but it was about a four-second pause. And they said, you know what, we're not happy with that. We think we can do even better. And what they started having their teams do is pre-charge their defibrillator at about a minute 45. They'd pre-charge their defibrillator, and then at that two-minute mark, they'd be ready to shock. So here is the next progression. So the next progression you can see um, here we go is they pre-charged their defibrillator you can see charge complete then they removed it but then they recharged the defibrillator again and their entire shock pause was uh, I think looks like six seconds here so what do you guys think about that 38 seconds to eight with a with maybe like four around the defib event and then this pause so what we're going to do is you're going to grade it all right so what would you guys say so grade the progression how would you grade the six month progression so this was a progression of giving feedback to their teams and their teams making some changes in performance and getting those pause times down. So what do you guys think? What's the grade? What grade would you give it? Are we happy teachers or are we frowny teachers? Hopefully no one's going to detention. What did they say? Ooh, got more A pluses that time. I like it. You guys, you know what, on this one, I honestly personally would give it an A plus. I think this hospital made some amazing changes and you know the staff really owned it they saw the CPR the report cards and they decided let's train you know a certain group of nurses who are going to defibrillate they pre-charge their defibrillator I don't know I agree I give it an A plus as well thanks for voting I love it so again this is all just fun and uh, just your opinion okay now this is what this is fascinating um, this is what mechanical CPR looks like so um, this in this uh, case they were using the Lucas device to give compressions you can can see how you get kind of get that double hump there uh, with the Lucas device and one of the really cool things um, the reason I put this case in here is that with the Lucas so when you're using mechanical CPR you can just do a super quick pause and just you know at the end of two minutes to just decide do I have a shockable rhythm or not and then one of the really cool things is you can actually shock right through while the patient's getting CPR so what you can see here so you can see the Lucas is going so you've got the Lucas going, ka-chunk, 
good chunk, good chunk it's going. They shock the patient here at um, the end of the first uh, uh, kind of strip, and then you get a blanking period from the device. So, um, and that, that's normal. But what I can tell you is CPR was still in progress. You just can't see it here, and they shocked right through. Um, are they? I'm sorry. They did compressions right through the defibrillation, which is pretty cool. It's it's that's one of the big advantages of using mechanical CPR is you can you know because when you defibrillate, you want to make sure that the the um, pump is primed with blood uh, to hopefully improve your shock success. And so um, so you can see here that's exactly what happened is they defibrillated right through CPR. All right. So here is now. Then this was. Um, a few minutes later, so they're still using, you can see they still have V-fib, and for this one, for whatever reason, they did not pre-charge the defibrillator, and you can see they took a somewhat, um, kind of a decent sized pause, you can see this was the Lucas going, and then they stopped, and stopped, and stopped, and so there was a, a decent pause, there was about a, ooh, what is this, about a 25 second pause, or actually more than that, probably almost a 30 second pause around defibrillation, so I would, you know, if I were giving feedback to this team, I'd say, great job on that first one, okay, what happened here, and, and I wouldn't say it like that, but I'd be like, you know, so what was the difference, and let them identify what the differences were, and then maybe have a discussion about always pre-charging your defibrillator, especially when you know you've got somebody who's in ventricular fibrillation. And so this is just kind of showing this, I'm uh, showing a different view of the CPR report card here, but you can see at minute 14, that was that big, about 30 second pause where the patient got shocked. Now, they started the Lucas back up right away, um, but unfortunately they took that big pause. And then you can see down, now one of the other things we're noticing with Lucas, and I'll tell you, if some of you are using the mechanical CPR devices, um, is you have to remember to shock. And so the reason I put this in here is um, I want you to know the patient was shocked at minute 14. Now this patient was clearly in V-fib. The patient did not get reshocked again until minute 21. So you've got to remember every two minutes to pause to see if you've got a shock over rhythm with the Lucas and shock. But you know, of course, of course, because the CPR is being taken care of, um, people a lot of times forget to assess every two minutes. So anyway, so this is you can see seven minutes without a shock, which again we'd give some feedback on that. And then down here at the bottom, you can see they nicely escalated the energy. Um, but there was a about a total of 31 second pause around that shock that I showed you guys. So again, that's just something they can clean up, but, but very doable to clean that up. So okay, all right. So we'll keep moving along here, looking at those pauses. So all right, and then this is just again another just bird's eye view showing you, um, a, you know, we shocked. So I was just kind of pulling it back and looking at the entire code. But um, so good, t good shock there. They they shocked, you know, right through. Uh, they did CPR right through shocking, but at minute 14, they had that big pause, and then at minute uh, 20, they had a, that other big pause. So again, giving this feedback and then let the staff decide, you know, what they would do different next time if they had to. So, okay. So we're going to keep going here. All right. So now this is, I wanted you to see what capnography looks like with and without a pulse. So again, you can see the double hump. So they're using mechanical CPR, they're using the Lucas device on this patient. And um, here you can see this is the capnography is the orange line and it's scaled on a scale of 0 to 50. And while the patient was pulseless in V-fib, you could see, um, so this is this point right here will be the end tidal CO2, it was 20, with CPR ongoing. And then I want you to see what it looks like when you get ROSC, or return of spontaneous circulation. So I'm going to pop up another um, strip. It's going to look really busy, but I want you to see um, what this looks like. And so here you can see, again, on a scale of 0 to 50, how now that end tidal CO2 is way over uh, normal, and that's all that CO2 flushing you know from the heart to the lungs um, and we pick it up on end tidal and you can see the capnography is over 50 so this is what um, and you can see uh, we're in an unorganized uh, v-fib there and then you can if you kind of look under all that impedance you see an organized rhythm and this is what it looks like when patients go from pulselessness with capnography into regaining their pulse so kind of a pretty cool progression 
Okay, so this was uh, another interesting case. Now, I, um, I did show this one last fall, but I think this case is fascinating. So this was a patient who came in with a STEMI. So they have ST elevation, and then the heart gets irritable. So you can see the heart gets irritable, and then they go into V-fib. So they go into V-fib, and there was about, oh, I'd say about a 30-second pause, or 20-second pause before uh, chest compressions got started, but they did indeed get started. So you can see here the change in the impedance signal. You can see chest compressions. And so... We've got chest compressions going, and they charged up their defibrillator. So they, you can see charge complete, and they shocked the patient. So the patient got a defibrillation, and then was the shock successful? And the answer is yes. You can see the patient went into an organized rhythm. They got right back on the chest and started compressions, but the cardiologist walked in and said, stop. What's the rhythm? And what they did was they stopped CPR, and you can see the patient went from an organized rhythm back into V-fib. And so again, you know, if you were to sh like say to somebody, hey, you know, you need to remember to get back on the chest and do compressions, um, would that be as meaningful as, as like, hey, look at this report card we just pulled. Um, you know, can um, let's talk about what happened during this code. You shocked, you got back on the chest, but then came off the chest for some reason, and then come to find out it was the cardiologist's request to come off the chest, and the patient went back into V-fib because of it. So. Then the next two minutes, um, same thing. So the patient's in ventricular fibrillation. They shock the patient. So you can see clear V-fib there. They shock the patient. Was the shock successful? And you can see if you look under that impedance signal that, yes, absolutely the shock was successful. Uh, but for the second time, there was a request that was made to uh, to stop CPR and the patient went back into ventricular fibrillation. So again, the report card is just going to be so much more meaningful than um, than just saying, hey, don't forget to stay on the chest. So now this was a fascinating case. So this was a case of a patient who was in ventricular fibrillation and um, you can see big pauses. So at minute seven, big pause. Um, you can see here at minute uh, 13 to 17, two minute 42 second pause and some of you might remember why why do we take that big pause and the reason was um, for intubation so this needs to stop <laughs> this is something that absolutely needs to stop and you think like when you went back to the team to say hey there was a two minute 42 second pause around intubation do you think they felt that and the answer is no I mean two minutes and 42 seconds uh, goes by really fast in a code and so anyway other issues that were identified is the patient got ROSC but then rearrested and um, there, it was almost a minute and 30 seconds before the staff identified that the patient was in V-fib. Um, other things is just, you know, multiple, multiple long pauses. This was V-fib, so this was absolutely a patient that, you know, you, you could potentially get back. But I think the bottom line, that thing that was fascinating, not only that time for intubation, but also it was 60 minutes of V-fib and the patient only got shocked seven times. So how often should you shock patients? And the answer is every two minutes. The patient should have received about 30 shocks and only got seven. So again, this is just really good feedback. You can't argue with this. This data, the data are what the data are and you cannot argue with it. And so, um, so I think it's just very powerful. But the thing that you have to be really careful about is just not giving this feedback in a blaming manner. It needs to be in a really safe environment where staff can just really reflect on what they would do differently, um, different in a code the next time. All right, so I'm gonna have you grade this one. So get ready, we're gonna launch a poll in just a second, but I want you to grade this one. So here's a case of V-fib. So I, I showed you guys this in the beginning. So this is a case of V-fib, and this is not CPR impedance. This is assisted ventilation impedance. So the patient's in V-fib, getting no compressions, and we go from uh, 10, it was 10.49 a.m., all the way until 10.52 a.m. without a shock or without compressions. All right, so what do you guys think about that? So given that, that's a, that's a pretty decent pause. We're going to launch a poll, and I want you to grade it. So how would you grade this case? So what grade would you give it? Are you all giving it an A+, plus, a B+, plus, a C+, plus, or are we going to detention? <laughs> or we can think about our performance. What do you think? Are there some frowny faces on this one, Emily? I'm afraid to say there are. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, you know, and I'm just so you guys know, I'm not laughing at the case because this is a case we need improvement. But it's just, you know, it's one of those things. I think anytime you get feedback, um, it's it's difficult to give feedback. Sometimes it's even more difficult to receive it. But you know, when you're dealing with patients' lives, I think we always just need to be open to receiving feedback um, and not being afraid to give it. So um, you know, feedback is is can be challenging sometimes, but really important in this case. Okay, Emily, we're ready to see how they voted. Oh, we're, yeah, going to detention. So, so yeah, I think this is definitely an opportunity um, for improvement. So we'll go back to the slides now. But this is definitely an opportunity for improvement. And, okay, so here is another case. You can see we're in VFib, patients in VFib, and you can see here that uh, their chest compression fraction is 91%. Looks pretty awesome. Um, compressing at about 113 a minute. Um, when you look kind of uh, at the uh, chest compression rates. In general, we're a little bit on the faster side, but doesn't look too, too bad. The pauses actually look really good. And you can see the capnography in the beginning of the case is low. And then what do you guys notice about the capnography over time? It gets much higher. So what do you think happened? This patient had return of spontaneous circulation. And so, um, just to kind of break it down, you can see here, now I'm going to have you guys grade this one too. So really short pause time, super, uh, a little bit longer than 10 seconds, but not bad. This is about 10 seconds. This is about 12 second pause time around defibrillation. So those little lightning bolts are defibrillations. The, CPR rate is a little fast, but you can see they slowed it down. So I don't know. This is a tough one, right? Um, the patient, this was a really long case. And one of the things you can tell is they started using a metronome. So this patient got shocked numerous, numerous times. This is a very long case. Um, then they got their rates really under control, did a nice job. And you can see the patient got shocked a total of 14 times. And you all know this was a 46-minute code. It's really hard to keep your performance up when you're resuscitating somebody that long. But really, when you dig down and look, they actually got better with time um, uh, in this case. So what I want you guys to do, this is our very last poll, is I want you to grade this. What do you guys think? This is a challenging case, 46-minute code. Um, they got the patient back. I don't know. They had, I think, some decent, um, they did a really good job with pauses. So how would you grade this? What do you guys think? So you give it an A plus. Um, so I put 41 minutes, but it was actually a 46 minute code. Um, a plus, a B plus, a C plus, or are they going to detention? So what do you guys think? Oh, okay, yeah. And, you know, you guys, this is a tough case. I actually think they did a really decent job. I agree. I would give it at least a B plus. Um, you know, a 46 minute case, you all know, is very challenging. They really tightened up those pause times around defibrillation. They got their rates completely under control. Um, I think they did a good job. So I would either I would give it a B plus. I agree with you. Okay. All right. So we ready? So now we're gonna finish off the webinar here. So last thing I want to go over is overventilation. And um, so when you use capnography, you definitely can get feedback during your arrest, but also post-event on ventilation rates. And you can see here, so first of all, let's just be really clear, how fast should we be ventilating? And the answer is, 10 per minute, so 10 per minute. And the problem with overventilation is, again, you have a direct impact on CPR quality because of the increase in the intrathoracic chest pressure. So you can see, you know, people just, they overventilate like crazy. And it's tough because the adrenaline's pumping, you know, the room's all excitable, it's loud, it's crazy. But this is one thing, this is low-hanging fruit. We've got to get this right. And so this was a case, you know, where, um, they uh, really identified and gave this feedback to the respiratory therapist, and then the RT started actually using their phones as kind of a stopwatch uh, to slow down their ventilation rate. And then you see this next case is, uh, you know, they're going even faster, 41, 45, 49, 51, 55 a minute. So this is way too fast. You can see um, each ventilation. And so we've just got to slow this down. But again, you know, when we when this feedback was given to the respiratory therapist, I will tell you they were shocked. And they said, wow, we've got to change. And they, they actually ended up making some big changes. So, all right, so this is kind of, this is the conclusion of this. I wanted to show you, again, just a really innovative way to get feedback to your teams. And I, I would love to know from you guys, like, oh, how would you feel about 
about getting a CPR report card, would you be open to it and just kind of open to looking at um, the changes? But again, improvements in CPR quality and performance can definitely be improved with feedback. Post-event review is, I think, essential in targeting system issues where we can focus a training. And bottom line is you're not going to improve what you don't measure. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Kimberly Kelly, who's going to take questions from you guys. All right. Thank you, Nicole. That was so helpful. That was so educational. I love learning stuff in this too, as well. So before we get started, I want to go over a few things just before um, we answer your questions, starting to talk about continuing education. Again, those continuing education credits for nurses and respiratory therapists. This activity has been approved for one contact hour by the California Board of Nursing and the Florida Board of Nursing. Go to www.sac testing.com forward slash SL. You're going to need to register on that test site and complete the evaluation form. And then upon submission, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. Your accreditation statements are as below. And again, this is sponsored by Physio Control, which is now part of Stryker. Now, at this time, we're going to kind of I'm going to, I've been reading all your questions, taking some really good notes, and I'm going to turn it over to ask Nicole some of the really burning questions you guys oh. have had. I know, they're super exciting. I'm going to ask <laughs> I'm ready. some of the questions I'm ready. that were repeated more than once. Okay. And the one good. that was repeated more than once consistently was... Uh, what software program do you use? Yeah, so each defibrillator manufacturer, um, so there's three defibrillator companies, they each have their own software. So to do this, what you'd have to do is reach out to the company um, that supplies your defibrillator and they can get you hooked up with this. So, so you know, it, the, there's three main manufacturers, so go back to whoever supplies your defibrillator. Okay, perfect. And I know there was a couple others that asked that as well. Another okay. couple of questions that were asked, and uh, unfortunately, I can't talk to this because I have no experience in neonates or kids or anything. Um, oh, no. Of, I know, <laughs> okay. I know. A couple of people asked. I don't asked do babies. I don't do babies. <laughs> okay, no, no, I'm joking. Let's hear it, though. Let's hear it. But you might hear, do you have any methods to rate neonatal CPR where a defibrillator is not very often utilized? And this was asked by both Elizabeth and Linda. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, there there definitely are um, feedback devices that can be used on neonates. Um, you know, but so I guess my question was, so even if you're using the pads or patches, you still, for most of the companies, should be able still to get feedback on your CPR quality because even though you're not using the defibrillator you're probably still placing the patches and it's the impedance data comes from those patches so as long as the patches are placed you should be able to get the, the feedback so I take that back um, sorry I didn't mean to be so reactionary about babies but um, yeah I, you know I, you, you should still be able to get and in fact um, the, the one study was done at CHOP I know they looked at kids over the age of eight but um, but they definitely resuscitate neonates as well so um, so there you go yes exactly so um, I can answer to this one Tina is asking, how do you suggest getting a metronome to codes? Is this something that lives on oh. each crash cart? Well, I can tell you from my personal experience, I have a metronome app on my phone, and it was free. It's called Metro Timer, and whenever I'm in a code situation, I will pull my phone up and pull that app out, and it's immediately set at 110 beats per minute, and it's pretty loud, and you would be surprised how many people residents, nurses come back around and be like, are you sure that's just 110? And they'll be very oh, surprised, it's funny you but say it's that, very Kim, effective. Yeah. yeah, it's funny you say that, Kim, because I've gotten the same thing. So um, here, I'm going to actually, I have a metronome, same thing, app on my phone, so you can hear it. Can you guys hear it? Maybe you can hear it. Um, yeah, I can So that's it. just from my phone. Okay, yeah, that's from my phone. Um, but so that would be one way on your phone. Um, other ways would be on the new generation um, defibrillators have metronomes built into them 
Um, so you, you can, you know, your defibrillators will have them. I, there's actually a hospital I'm working with who they got these like musical uh, metronomes. So I mean, I played piano when I was a little kid and I, uh, like, I had PTSD from the, the metronome. <laughs> and then I walked into this hospital and saw them. But you can actually use like a musical metronome as well. And that's what they did. So lots of different ways. I think the easiest is your phone though, to be quite frankly honest. If, if it's not built into your defibrillator. But I would use the metronome on your defibrillator. Now, funny thing, and I, I said this in a previous webinar, um, there was a facility that I had been working with that where the staff were really resistant to using metronomes. They were like, oh, it's too noisy. We don't want to use it. And then the medical director was seeing with these CPR report cards how fast they were compressing. And he said, use the metronome. You have to use the metronome uh, on the defibrillator. So then they did. And funny enough, they did a qualitative survey about, about like six or month, nine months later. And the staff actually reported that people were being quiet in codes because they're using the metronome. So, you know, it's kind of funny how that happens. But um, yeah, but I, lots of different ways to use a metronome. I can also speak to that quietness in the codes because everybody wants to hear the timing. Yeah. Um, Ruby asked what the name of the app was again. The one that I personally use is called Metro Timer. Metro Timer. I'm going to look that and up. It's free. I'm going to get a new one. Free. Is, we love free. I know. We love free. So, you we know, this, we love free. <laughs> Metro Timer. Uh, Karen asked, would data collection rating for CPR be open to legal issues? Oh, I love that question. Thanks for asking that. Um, so, so this is what I would say is don't put these report cards in a patient's chart. This should be used purely for quality improvement. And the way you would think of this is the same way you would think about filling out a PSN. Um, so if you, you know you don't document PSN you know filled out because you know we messed up or whatever. Um, that sounded a little crude, but you know, you know what I mean. Like so, so you would never say that in your documentation. So same thing is I would never put these reports in a patient's chart. I would only use them in the guise of quality improvement. Perfect. Same. Uh, Linda is asking, to what extent could the longer pauses in CPR, either mechanical or by person, be attributed to intubation interval? And I know you talked about that in your previous slides, but yeah. maybe is it more frequent than just pausing, or is it is is intubation really kind of the cause of why we're pausing? Well, I mean, honestly, we pause for so many different reasons. Intubation, I would say, is tops. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll get requests to say stop compressions while we intubate. And you know, I um, one of the webinars in the fall, and just so you guys know, all of the webinars I've done previously are all archived. So if you want to go back and look at them, you can. But I showed a study that was published not even quite a year ago where they actually ask the question, do we need to intubate in codes? And the thing is, if you've got an open airway with a bag valve mask, you do not need to intubate. The data were actually pretty clear. And so, um, you know, but again, we have pauses around defibrillation. We have pauses around pulse checks. I jokingly say we've got pauses because we're like squirrel and we're all distracted. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm being a little sarcastic there. But, you know, but we pause for so many reasons. And I think we just need to be more mindful of this and make sure somebody's on the chest. If someone's not on the chest, the patient's not getting perfused. And bot that's the bottom line, is you just got to be more mindful of it during all these different events. So it's everything, really. Fantastic. There are some really great questions here. A couple of them are asked by respiratory therapists, uh, both Sean and um, Mike, and I apologize if I butcher your name. Uh, the one that was asked was, in my experience as a respiratory therapist, we're often told by the physician to ventilate faster, even oh, though, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, that got pulled out of the way, even though um, we know not to ventilate more than 10 breaths a minute. How would you recommend dealing with this scenario? Yeah, I mean, that that's purely an educational issue. So, uh, so I'm guessing that you're getting the request because somebody does a gas and they come in during the code and they read off the gas and they're like 7.12, CO2 is 80 and then the provider hears CO2 of 80 and says bag faster. And the thing is, 
during the resuscitation is not the time to correct the PaCO2. You're going to have big VQ mismatch. That is normal in resuscitation because you're in cardiac arrest. And the, the bottom line is just ask why. Why do you want me to bag faster? And then I, I personally, I would not do it. It is against, it will, it will have a direct and negative impact on your CPR quality. It is 10 a minute. That is how fast you should be ventilating um, according to the data that we, and the knowledge that we have here today. And so, you know, I, I would ask why why and if it's to treat that CO2 just tell them you know what we'll treat it when when we get ROSC because it's going to have a negative impact because of the increases in intrathoracic chest pressure so I you know it's a common issue I, I know um, when I do the capnography talk I always address that specific case scenario don't do it just don't do it you can't that, that, that's not a good reason to I agree uh, Lise asked what is your opinion regarding length of code time Oh, yeah. You know, there's been some interesting data on hospital rest saying that we give up too quick. Fascinating. And actually, one of the big papers came from the hospital that I worked at for many years um, saying that we give up too fast on these patients. And so um, I, I think it all depends. I think it depends on, first of all, what type of a code is it? Is it asystole with, um, you know, found down asystole, uh, you know, uh, end title that's less than 10? I would not honestly go too long on a code like that. If it's V-fib arrest and you've got a decent end title, I'd be asking, can we get this patient to the cath lab? And I honestly would push not to give up until we had, we were in the cath lab artery open. And with V-fib arrest, a lot of V-fib arrest codes are from an occluded coronary artery. And so V-fib, I would treat a lot differently. V-fib, you go gangbusters until you can intervene. V-fib, a lot of times we think is a symptom of an occluded coronary artery. Now, if it's a PEA arrest, you've got to figure out differential. And in a lot of hospitalized patients, it's pulmonary embolism. And again, with a PE, you've got to intervene. You know, can the patient go to the cath lab for thrombectomy? Um, you know, can they do TPA? Um, but really, you You've got to focus on that differential. So PEA and VFib, I would probably go a lot longer until we figured out the differential, reverse the cause, or got that patient to the catham if, if it's VFib. But asystole, found down, yeah, just not a good scenario. Agreed. My personal hospital doesn't use the CPR report cards or feedback, but we do recognize the ability that you need to keep going in VFib and VTAC arrest. Uh, Thomas and Ruby asked a question, is it optimal to establish a stable rhythm before intubation in order to minimize, minimize delay in compressions? Yeah, that's what the data are showing is that there was definite benefit as long as, now I want to be clear, as long as you have an open airway and you're able to ventilate, um, that a lot of, in a lot of facilities are now kind of transitioning where they're intubating only when they get ROSC or return of spontaneous circulation. So um, yeah, th that's what the data are showing so far. And if you go back to the, um, I think I put it in the capnography webinar, I actually cited the source there um, of that paper. It was yes. published not even a year ago. Yeah. So this is new data. Go look it up. One more question, and it was asked by multiple people. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, ask Victoria's though. Who, in regards to respiratory therapist, nurse, physician, is on the team reviewing and representing the reports and data? I can oh, tell you from sure. my personal hospital because I um I have taken on the role as lead responder. I am actually in charge of reviewing all the data, and so what I do is I go through all the charts and all of the um documentation that of people who have had cardiac arrest and I am able to look through it again we don't have the CPR report card but I'm able to see kind of the basics and if they followed C ACLS and everything else but who would be reviewing the team and representing the reports Nicole yeah I think for the most part um, in most facilities and remember there aren't many facilities doing this quite yet but in most facilities it's the code blue committee and um, but you know the one thing I would say is um, it's the code blue committee but what I would say is it can't stop there, right? What good does it do if you get these CPR report cards and the Code Blue Committee never gets the info to the end users, uh, you know, the, the people that are actually in the codes? And so, um, so you know, I think um, usually it's the Code Blue Committee who owns it, but you've got to disseminate this information. Yes, so that's I my, agree. That's my feedback on that. Yes. So. Uh, well, I, with our yeah. Blue team, we do the same thing as well. Well, thank you, Nicole. Yeah, that was these are awesome question. questions. I love it. 
Well, I want to thank you both Nicole and Kimberly for this excellent presentation today. And now this does conclude our session for today. I'm Emily Eberly, and from everyone here at Sachs Communications and Physio Control, we thank you for watching and have a great rest of the day. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.